Hello, my name is Stefano Stabellini. I work for AMD and I'm one of the Excel maintainers. And my name is Bertrand Marquis. I'm a principal software engineer at ARM and also one of the Xen on ARM maintainers. What is safety? So uh, the definition is on the screen, but safety comes into play for software every time human lives are at risk. So you can think of automotive, avionics, any, or even industrial, there are situations where soft, software malfunctioning could cause harm. In all of those cases, um, there need to be very strict guidelines uh, so that the software uh, cannot, you know, cannot put or minimize the risk of the software putting uh, human lives at risk. Um, and these guidelines fall under the umbrella of software certifications, safety certifications. Uh, one of the most popular used in automotive and other environment is ISO 26262, but there are others as well. And they typically involve uh, very strict coding guidelines like MISRA C, um, meant for safety to reduce um, uh, undefined behavior and also just defects in the code. And also strict guidelines on testing and documentation and also how to write requirement for the code is, is, is a pretty significant endeavor. Why exam matters for safety? In the ma vast majority of uh, situations, uh, software that um, has safety requirement has actually a mix of critical software and not critical uh, components. And that is because typically in, in any of your environment, you're gonna have a smaller function that is critical for the, fun the actual functionality um, of the device. Uh, so, so um, of, the, of the vehicle, if it's a car, and then there is a number of, of components, software components that are usually larger, um, more prone to crashing, but they're not actually required, for, strictly required for the functionality of the device. So in a car, think of the infotainment system. So, this is, so these environments are called mixed criticality because there is a mix of critical and non-critical components. So in these mixed criticality systems that are extremely common, it's always better to separate out the critical component in a set different environment. So that non-critical uh, software, which is larger, uh, harder to check, easier to crash, cannot affect the critical uh, function. Basically, you don't want to put all your eggs in a single basket. And a technology like Zen allows you to have many baskets and specifically allows you to run uh, the critical function in its own separate domain, in its own separate virtual machine, separate from the others uh, that are running non-critical functions. So that if the non-critical functions crash, uh, they don't affect uh, the critical function, which is completely isolated. So Xen has been doing that for years in other environments. For instance, highly secure environments. So QBOS, OpenXT, other projects are famous for uh, setting up highly secure desktop and laptop uh, environments. Um, and um, uh, the, the way they work is they use Zen to isolate your critical environment, which is maybe your work environment, from your non-critical environment, which is your personal environment. In Embedded today, we are also using Zen for mixed criticality. We are separating, separating out the critical environment, which is typically a real-time application, an ARTOS, uh, that is controlling a, a, um, like a robotic arm, for instance, uh, or, or the critical function of the industrial device, just to make an example, separating that out from Linux, uh, that is usually the user interface or uh, it talks to the cloud. Um, safety critical systems are mixed, critical, uh, mix, mixed criticality systems as well. So that's why Xen is, is relevant for safety, but is it a good match? So yes, Zen is a good match. It has been a very long time since the early days of the cloud where Zen was small, but not that small, and the Linux environment was always required as DOM zero. Nowadays, things are very different. Zen is actually very small. It's less than 50,000 lines of code and decreasing thanks to the K-Config infrastructure is gonna be even, even smaller. Uh, it doesn't need DOM zero any longer. DOM zero has become only optional. Uh, thanks to DOM zero less. Now Xen can start domains at boot time directly from the hypervisor. Xen also always had a microkernel architecture, but now we are exploiting it to the fullest uh, so, uh, to uh, decrease uh, the privilege of large amount of code, running it in unprivileged domains, assigning devices to them 
but with full protection of the SNMU. So the end result is large amount of your code don't need to be safety certified any longer because they're not privileged over the system, not privileged over any of the critical functions. Can support real time uh, in terms of interrupt latency and also cache isolation, uh, as we'll see later, and does a very thorough code review process as well as security process, uh, which are uh, very important for safety. This is an example of how Xen can be used in a, uh, in a, in a safety environment, and it's already used in similar environments that don't have safety um, requirements today. Uh, so you have uh, the critical application running on Zephyr, uh, which is, for instance, a, re a real-time remote uh, you know, a controller, a controller of, a, of a robot application. And then uh, you have Linux alongside uh, with a larger um, with a larger code base, uh, running larger applications with network access, for instance, controlling cloud APIs. So in this in this example, as you can see, there is no DOM zero. So the safety components are Zephyr and Zen. Linux is is non doesn't have any safety uh, requirements, uh, and there is no DOM zero. Another example, uh, more complex, is automotive. Uh, there is a larger CPU cluster and more VMs, but there is one main difference from the, one, from the example before, and the, and the difference is now we also have a DOM0. But let me go through step by step. So we still have the larger Linux environment, which doesn't have any safety uh, requirement on the right, for instance, running the infotainment system. We have the inst instrument cluster and Zephyr real time, maybe a sensor uh, par data parsing application, which have, we do have sa safety requirement and they're smaller and, and more tightly written. Uh, we also have on the left, a, a Zephyr mini DOM0. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can still have a DOM0 uh, for monitoring, for checking the health state of your overall system, um, but it doesn't have to be Linux. It doesn't have to be a full or powerful DOM0. It could be a very small, tiny um, DOM0 environment with just a couple of monitoring functionalities and it could be based on Zephyr. And there are, that is already a work in progress. So real time and exam. So before digging into the subject, it is important to make sure everybody has the same understanding of real time. So what is real time in software? On the right, right side, I have some stat statistic on the response time of an application. The application is fast, as most of the time it is answering in less than five milliseconds. But being fast is not being real time. And saying that it can do the job on average in five milliseconds is not real time. Here, the application is never answering in more than 100 milliseconds. If I can say I will give a response to an event in no more than 100 milliseconds, then I am real time. So real time is responding in a guaranteed amount of time. Why is this concept important in safety? So let's take an example. My car must stop before a wall. If I take all the right parameters, so maximum speed of the car, how long I need to stop, when will I detect the wall, I can come up with a maximum time that my software can take to answer to a wall detection and action the brake. Respecting this is definitely important for safety. If my software does not respond in time, I meet the wall. So turning those kind of constraints to software is an analysis named worst case execution time or WCET. This is, this is an analysis done by demonstration and not by tests. Tests are usually used to confirm the demonstration. The path taken for the WCET is usually involving a combination of cases that are impossible to trigger by tests. In Zen project, there are several subjects uh, we are investigating around real time. First investigated subject is the interrupts and in particular the interrupt latency. This is the maximum time until a guest receives an interrupt. When an interrupt is raised in hardware, Xen is catching it first. If the interrupt is for a guest, it will forward the interrupt to this guest. The complete time needed to handle the interrupt depends on the guest and the processing done for the interrupt. The point of the analysis is to check if Xen can forward the interrupt in a definite amount of time. We did the analysis on ARM64 with a guest alone on its own CPU core. Zephyr was used as a real-time guest and we used the timer uh, interrupt. 
a real use case would be something like a periodic task running on a real-time OS on top of them. We did the analysis by code analysis and inspection, and we confirmed the findings using hardware tracing on a real target. Overall, Xen can need up to 1,090 instructions to forward on interrupt with several big steps. First, saving the guest context. When the interrupt occurs, the guest is running, so we need to save its state first. Then running the guest interrupt handler and init the handler specific for the virtual timer. Finally, restore the guest context so that it can handle the interrupt. Overall number is quite good. On a modern CPU, 1000 instruction is not much. In general, there are lots of conditions which could impact this number of instructions. So to come down to this number, we took some assumption and came up with some limitation. The real-time guest must not use any hypercalls. If the interrupt occurs while uh, we are handling on hypercalling then, there would be some extra time needed to finish this hypercall before handling the interrupt. No interaction with guests on other core. If during this process a guest on another core is sending a cross-core interrupt, this would make them do more uh, operation. Uh, Xen in init phase is also not considered in the analysis. During the initialization phase, Xen is doing a lot of stuff and we cannot consider that the system is set up. So we took out of the analysis of the initialization of Xen. Finally, the configuration is fixed to remove some possible operations that would require lots of processing in the game. For example, create guests, create communication channels, or add memory. So this work was the first step and we discovered several issues or limitations that would need some extra work in the future. There are several cases inside Xen where a cross-core interrupt could be generated that could impact this number. For example, RSCUs, uh, read copy updates, uh, which are delayed tasks, which could impact this number. We have isolated the core on its, the guest on its own core. What if we want to have several guests? We turn off WFI, WFE only, which is not good for power consumptions. And also pre PV drivers could not be used as they could also uh, generate uh, interrupts. The full analysis will be published soon and will contain a lot more details. Another area we are working on is MPU support. Uh, before explaining what uh, MPU is, let's refresh our knowledge on what a MMU is. So the MMU is used to translate virtual address to physical address and also limit the accessible addresses of an application or a guest. To translate, we use page tables, which give for a virtual address the physical address. Those are stored in memory. The CPU has TLBs, which are kind of a cache to prevent going through the page table on all accesses. This system is hard to use for real time as the worst case time required can be high. When something is not in the TLB, we need to go through the page table in memory which can have some cache effects. If other cores are doing operation with uh, the MMU, those could end up in some TLB flushed, triggered by other cores. Also, if there are several guests running on the same cores, the TLBs might be flushed by this guest because it has other needs for, for mapping, and as a consequence, our application will behave differently. An MPU is a much simpler system. There is no translation, so virtual address is the same as physical address. The MPU is only used to restrict accessible addresses and set attributes, like cacheable, executable, etc. And the MPU is only using coprocessor register, so there is no page tables and no cache effects or issues related to TLB miss or sync. On ARM architecture, the core text R and the RET2 architecture in particular is being worked on. It has support for both MMU and MPU. At EL2, the execution level where Xen is running, there is only MPU support. This MPU is used for Xen itself and also to control what is accessible by guest. At EL1, the execution level for guest, there can be an MPU to be used by a real-time OS, for example, Zephyr, or on MMU for non-real-time applications, Linux, for example. The architecture and Xen will allow the cohabitation of real-time guests using MPU and non-real-time ones using the MMU. Xen will support both time to allow real-time to cohabit with non-real-time 
and Linux in particular. A proof of concept of this work is already available and the final support is being upstream Linux then. Another thing that is really very relevant to real time and interrupt latency is cache. The reason is in many SOCs today, there is a single shared L2 cache across uh, the, um, the entire CPU cluster. Being shared, what it means is um, an application running on core four uh, that otherwise would have fetched directly uh, the data from the L2 cache, which is very fast, instead has to go all the way to DDR because another application on core number one uh, access other data end up evicting uh, the information on the in the H2 cache relevant to core four. So it's very hard to predict whether core four is going to be able to fetch data from L2 or from DDR and the difference in performance is really great. And this is particularly damaging uh, for small bare metal application or real time OSs that will fit the entire interrupt handler uh, in the L2 cache. Uh, and will have a far, far smaller uh, and more deterministic uh, interrupt latency otherwise. So the, the solution to this problem is to split the cache in software, uh, fully dedicating cache lines to each uh, VM so that then you are guaranteed that if the uh, code is small, then you're going to entirely fit in the L2 and therefore the performance is going to be great and there are not going to be variations. Um, so this is what we call cache coloring. Cache coloring is uh, identifying this small subset of cache, which we call color, and assigning color to each VM. And the way it works is by, um, on, uh, on the Xilinx ZCU 102, is to uh, finding the correlation between physical addresses and these cache lines. Uh, and then uh, um, allocating memory in a very, in a smart way, very carefully to VMs so that they always end up hitting the same cache lines, so the same colors. The trick is to allocate one page every 16. So one page every 16, so page zero, page 16, and so on, is color zero. And then page one, page 17, and so on, is color one, and so on. So allocating pages, memory pages, by color, let you uh, fully dedicate cache lines to each VM. And therefore, then you have no more uh, cache interference effect, a much uh, lower interrupt latency, and more importantly, like Bertrand was explaining earlier, more deterministic interrupt latency. That uh, on our board, it measure um, very close to three microseconds. Let's discuss about the static configuration with example. So what is it? It's defining completely the system statically in a configuration file. So this is how many guests and their characteristics but also the communication channels. So why does it matter for safety? In a safety scenario, we want to avoid all possible random behaviors and make sure our system is exactly the same upon reboot. This is the guests and the communication, but also the behavior of the hardware and the guests themselves. So we want to use the same address in memory, the same cores, etc. We also want to reduce the amount of testing, so defining everything statically limit the possibilities and usually allow to reduce the code size. In Xen case, this could be disabling some hyper calls or some section of Xen code. We also want non-dynamic behavior to limit complexity. So we allocate and create everything on boot and there is no free. All in all, the goal is to reduce cost of certification by reducing the core base or, or the code base or make it simpler by reducing the cases. First example of static configuration is Xen uh, DOM 0 less. So this subject was already uh, mentioned by Stefan. So DOM 0 less is a system to define guests in a configuration file. This is how much guests you want, how many memory for each, which hardware devices they have access to, or how many CPUs they can use. Those DOM 0 less guests are created directly on boot and defined directly in the device tree. You have um, a simple example here. In a safety world, this has several advantages. First is to remove the need for a complex DOM0. DOM0 is usually a Linux, and depending on something that complex for safety is not possible. Second, it allows guests to boot quickly, as they are started directly by Xen without the need to wait for DOM0 to boot and then create them. Finally, 
it is reducing the system and gland exam complexity as it does not need to support to create gas dynamically. Most hypercalls in XEN are dedicated to DOM0, so removing them is reducing XEN code base a lot. This feature is already available in XEN. Second static configuration example is static memory. So this is the ability to define the physical address and size to use for all needs of the system. This is the gas memory, the XEN heap used for XEN internal allocation, and the XEN guest heap, which is used for all allocation in XEN related to a guest. For example, it's page, uh, page, level two page tables. All those can be defined in the device tree configuration. You have a, a small example here. For safety, this has several advantages. First, the system will be the same upon reboot. There is no allocator involved that could change where a guest actual RAM is physically. It is also reducing possible interferences. This is mainly thanks to the guest heap, as one guest cannot starve Xen memory anymore. In a standard system, all allocations are done using the same basket. Finally, if a guest needs to be added to the system in a future version, existing guests could, say where they, could stay where they are without any impact, and the new guest could be assigned on memory not used. This concept is very important for incremental certification, and only certify what was changed or added to the system. Upstreaming of this feature is in progress and it will be available in next Xen version. Third static configuration example is communication. Standard systems are using Xen bus based drivers to communicate, for example, PVNet or PV block drivers. Xen bus requires DOM0 or at least a Linux system to be used. The drivers overall are very good performance, but are quite complex and require accessing one guest memory from, a, from another guest dynamically. So a simpler, more static system is required. For this, two new features are introduced. First one is static shared memory. This is defining areas of memories in the system, which are accessible by several guests. This is defined in the device tree, you have an example here where you define the physical memory area and which guests have access to it. Second part is static event channels. Events are used to, signaling, to do signaling between guests and we allow here to create event channels statically. Those are also defined in the device tree. Using a combination of those two systems, any protocol of communication can be easily built on top of them. So this is currently being upstream in Xen and will be available in next Xen release. We will also provide example and support for Linux and Zephyr guests. Final static configuration example is static CPU pools. CPU pools is the ability to define which cores are usable by which guests. This concept is already existing in Xen, which we, uh, was announced to allow statically define the CPU pool. A CPU pool is a pool containing cores. It can have one or several cores and can be assigned a specific scheduler. A core can only be assigned to one pool. A guest can then be assigned to a CPU pool. Several guests can run in the same CPU pool. The scheduler is an independent between the CPU pools. CPU pools can now be defined in the device tree and DOM 0 less guests can be assigned to a specific CPU pool. You have an example here. This feature has been upstream and will be available in the next Xen release. Thanks, Bertrand. Um, so um, as part of the Xen um, FUSA Special Interest Group, we are following a series of activities uh, to make Xen easier to safety certify. What does it mean? So in, in practice today, Xen has already been safety certified together with um, other software components and hardware components. Uh, but in a, at least a couple of situ situations in, in recent years, and some of them were even being discussed at Zen Summit in public presentations. So it has been used in safety certified systems already. However, all the work to make Zen safety certified was done downstream. Uh, so uh, any co required uh, code changes or docs or testing, it was all done uh, downstream. So, so there is a significant work that needs to be that needs to happen once you take a, a vanilla upstream Zen release before you can use it in a safety certified system. 
So the goal of uh, the SIG is to make Xen easier to safety certified. So, so to make so Xen is already safety certifiable, but make it more safety certifiable to make it closer to safety certifications. So aligning it with the requirements. And yes, so they're going to they're going to be gaps. So the gaps are going to be expected, and user will have to fill these gaps. But the gaps are going to be fewer uh, going forward and better documented. So one thing, one one of the most important aspects of this is clarity. So today we are actually already following several of the guidelines required by safety certification. It's just that we don't talk about it. It's not clear which one are the one we follow and the one we don't follow. So one of the most important thing going forward is going to be to clarify really which one of the rules we already follow so that the user can easily or more easily estimate the work to um, bring them up to, um, to standards, filling the gaps for the things we, we don't yet do. And we're starting from the code. Uh, why starting for the code? So the uh, safety certification have a number of requirements that go beyond the code itself, such as docs and testing and, and requirements. Uh, but the code is for sure as the main output of the project, the main focus of the Xen community, and also the thing that we are most expert on. While other things such as docs, requirements, and tests are easier for somebody that's not necessarily very familiar with Xen, but knows about safety certification uh, to, to do and to write. So for these reasons, uh, we are focusing on the code first, and in sp specifically we are focusing on these three aspects. And, and one is coding style, coding guidelines, and misery C. And I'm going to talk to you more in a second about that. We are also focusing on determinism, and you have heard from Bertrand all of the all that we are doing and already already done and plan to do uh, in in the coming months about uh, interpending determinism, as well as static memory allocations. Finally, K-Configs, so the K-Configs allow us to go smaller and smaller is a lot better in terms of safety certification because it means uh, fewer bugs and uh, few, less code, fewer lines of code to safety certify. So we want to enhance the K-Config infrastructure so that we can remove even more parts of the code from the build. So why MISRA? Um, so MISRA, uh, MISRA is uh, the de facto standard in all industry sector for safe uh, C uh, code, coding style and coding guidelines. It's maintained and backed by an authority the organization, the MISRA consortium. Uh, and as a, uh, its pragma pragmatic approach is a good match for Xen. So by that I mean the MISRA always states never to sacrifice code quality for compliance. And definitely code quality is of the utmost importance uh, to, to all in the Xen community, to all the maintainers and contributors. So what is the status? So already last year, uh, we went through a process that usually referred to as tailoring, where you go through MISRA and you uh, um, define a subset of the rules that are relevant to the project. So for Xen, uh, this subset is a little bit more than 100 rules. And uh, what we're doing now is to um, uh, go through this list and uh, adopt the rules officially in the, uh, in the coding style. Just last week, we uh, agreed with the other maintainers in the community to accept the first 15 rules uh, out of 100 uh, in, the, um, in the coding style. So we're starting from the rules that are easier, of course, uh, which are basically a rules that we are already following in practice, also not officially. Then we're going to go through, but slowly through all of them, uh, carefully also looking at the deviations and whether we want to just document uh, deviations of the rules or instead fixing uh, the, you know, the, the violation of the rule. Or simply some of these rules, we might decide not to follow them at all, but in that case, that cannot be automatically scanned by MISRA C checkers. Speaking of MISRA C checkers, they are the biggest advantage of, for one of the biggest advantages at least, to follow MISRA C, is that we can use very powerful static code analyzers to check for violations in both existing code base and even better in new patches coming in. So we can autom automatically with the static code analyzer scan for ma very many, all of these 100 and something rules, uh, for each patch coming in, and that will ease significantly the code review burden of the maintainers and improve code quality. Uh, 
It's also good to follow Mesa C because it's going to improve the safety of the code, of course, the security of the code, because safety and security have a very large overlap. And also uh, widen compiler compatibility, making sure we don't have any undefined behavior and do not violate the standards. In terms of tooling, we're focusing on two. Uh, one is uh, CPP check is an open source tool. It doesn't have full coverage of the Mesa C rules we care about, but it's open source, does, uh, easily accessible. Uh, and uh, anybody can use it um, in, in a few steps. Uh, then we are also working with Roberto Bagnara and Vatseng uh, uh, with Eclair. Eclair is a fantastic tool. It has 100% coverage of the rules that we are working with. It's the, it's the tool that we are currently using for evaluating uh, this subset with this tailored set, subset of rules. Uh, and it can automatically scan also for uh, changes like patches coming in, not just the full code, full code base. Um, and it's available at eclairit.com. So if you want to see it in action, click on the button and then you'll see a, a few projects, including Zen, and you can see the results, for example, publicly for the latest staging and master branches of, of our tree. Future work. So um, we have a few things in the pipeline, as you have seen. So uh, in terms of determinism, uh, we want to make the interrupt handling code pass fully deterministic, and that's the full, uh, following, uh, following up from uh, the work that Bertram's team has already done, so completing, publishing the work, and then making any changes required, like for instance, to the RCU subsystem uh, um, to, to make the code pass fully deterministic. Memory allocation, we are actually pretty far ahead here. Even in just the next Zen release, you might get full memory static memory allocations uh, so that uh, dynamic allocations are not required any longer. And even handling of memory is a lot more aligned uh, with safety certification requirements. Improving K-Config, as mentioned earlier. Uh, today, uh, with the K-Config infra infrastructure that we have, we can go down to 50,000 lines of code. I think we can go down further to 30,000 or probably even less. Uh, that's what we're looking at now. Misero C is an activity ongoing. So it, it, we just started looking at these rules. And like I said, the first 15 were accepted last week. And um, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, 15 more will be um, evaluated and accepted. Uh, documentation, documentation and testing. So. Um, there are, there are strong requirements on both uh, for safety certifications and the documentation uh, specifically, we're working on with Doxygen to improve the infrastructure so that it's easier to add code uh, documentation in the, in the future. And for testing, we're working on two, progress, two projects. One is Git, GitLab CI for uh, testing uh, and we are improving the infrastructure there uh, so that it's easy to add tests together with patch series and scans, uh, for, you know, runs this test automatically on patch, uh, on new patches coming in. And XTF that stands for Xen Testing Framework that is very useful for uh, test individual uh, Xen interfaces. Okay, that is the end of the presentation. So feel free to ask us questions on the uh, chat and we'll be here to answer.